fit test is in four part, part 1, part 2, part 3, and part 4. Now look at part 1. Part 1 wants to relocate to the United States. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 6. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 6. Good morning, and how can I help you? Good morning. My name is Sandra da Costa. I'm a first-year student, and I'm a bit confused about a few things. I was told by a lecturer to come here. OK, then. Take a seat, Sandra, and let me see how I can help you. Because this is your first year here, I'll need a few personal details. What did you say your name was again? Sandra da Costa. Is that Sandra? No, it's spelt with an O. So that's S-O-N-D-R-A. Mm -hmm. And can you spell your surname, please? It's D-A-C-O-S-T-A. -A. Is that all one word? No, it's two words, actually. Fine. And are you living on campus or in other accommodation? I'm living in university residences in Bramble House, the one on the main campus, room number 13. How are you finding it so far? Much better than I expected. I have quite a large room, and we have a shared kitchen and bathroom. The other students I've met seem really friendly. That's good to hear. I think you've made a wise decision living on campus. Now, just a few more details, and then we can go on to discuss what's worrying you. Where are you from? My mother is from South America, but I was born in the north of Spain. That's interesting. And uh, one more thing. Do you have a number we can contact you on in emergencies? Yes, I have a mobile number. It's 07764 Let's just check that. Did you say 07764 No, it's 54302. That's fine, Sandra. Thank you. That's all the information I need for the moment. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 7 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 7 to 10. So, how can I help you? Well, I'm really worried about how I'm going to cope with university life. I mean, I feel like I don't know what's going on. Don't worry, Sandra. Most undergraduates feel like this in their first week. Well, maybe if I knew the campus a bit better, that might help. Do you have a map of the campus? Yes, I was given one during orientation week, but to be honest, I don't really understand it. Well, let's look at it together. OK, we are here now in Dalton House. Mm -hmm. Opposite this building is the arts block, where you'll find the computers. The computer rooms are open from 9am till 10.30pm weekdays, but closed on the weekends. Are there no other computers on campus? There are a few in the library that are available throughout the year, except Sundays. To get to the library, you keep going down University Lane, past the science block on your left. Opposite the science block are the chemistry labs, and the library is just on the right, next to Lab B. Fine. Another important building is the Students' Union. Turn left into Newton Drive. There are some trees and a little outside cafeteria. The Students' Union is just behind this. One thing I must check, have you sorted out your fees yet? Well, I filled in a direct debit form, so I suppose that means everything is fine. Probably, but you should go to the finance office just to make sure. It's at the end of Newton Drive. You'll need some identification, your passport or student ID. And is there a bank on campus? Yes, it's open normal banking hours and there is a 24-hour cash machine. 
The bank's in Isaac Street, which runs parallel to University Lane, where we are now. Go past Lecture Hall B, and the bank is opposite, just before you get to Lecture Hall A. Great. Probably the best thing to do is to walk around and familiarise yourself with everything. Don't worry, it won't take you long to settle in. I'm sure you're right. I feel a lot better. I also need you to fill in this form for the tutorial file. Take it away with you, and then make an appointment to see me again, and we'll go over it. My telephone number is on the form here at the bottom of the page. You can ring me any time between 9 a.m. and 3:30 p.m. from Monday to Friday,、uh, except on a Thursday when I'm only available in the morning. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You will hear a radio interview about a lakeside resort. First, you have some time to look at questions eleven to fifteen. As you listen to the first part of the talk, answer questions eleven to fifteen. Good afternoon, and welcome to today's show. The warm months are with us, and many of you are getting ready to plan vacation trips. To help you with that, we have a special guest today, Robert Sampson, director of the Golden Lake Resort. Robert. I understand Golden Lake is a popular place for families to spend their vacations. Yes, families enjoy spending time at Golden Lake. Many come back year after year. We have a spectacular location, and fun activities for both children and adults. Could you describe for us some of the activities available at Golden Lake? We have a lot of water activities, of course, since we're right on the lake. We have a pleasant sandy beach for swimming. We also have canoes and sailboats available, and many of our guests enjoy boating on the lake. I imagine water skiing would be popular among your guests. Actually, we don't permit water skiing in the resort area. It can be dangerous for swimmers and for the canoeists too. We do have a great location for fishing, though, and you'll often see guests fishing from our dock or from the canoes. That sounds very relaxing. What about activities on land? Do you have facilities for tennis? We had tennis in the past, but the courts fell out of repair, and since we found that most of our guests weren't interested in the game, we closed the courts down. So that's no longer an option. And naturally, because of our location in the woods, we don't have an adequate area for a golf course. But I'd like to let your listeners know that we'll be adding a new activity this year. We've made an arrangement with the local stable. So now we're going to have horseback riding available for our guests. We've created several riding trails around the lake. That sounds lovely. Now, what about rainy days? What can your guests do when the weather's bad? We have a games room and a crafts room. When the weather's rainy, some of our very talented staff members offer arts and crafts classes for all ages. What fun! Do you offer any other classes or activities? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions sixteen to twenty.
Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. We have a weekly schedule of evening activities which anyone can attend if they choose. Every Sunday we show a film, always something that's suitable for the whole family. Monday's my favourite night because that's dessert night. Our cook prepares a variety of desserts and we get to taste them all. Mmm, I'd like to be there for that. Yes, it's great. We get more serious toward the middle of the week. Our discussion night is on Tuesday. Discussion night? Yes, we discuss different current events, depending on what's happening that week in the news. Then on Wednesdays, we have lectures. We invite different experts to talk about local history or nature topics. This is actually one of our most popular evening activities. We found that our guests are really interested in learning about the local area. It sounds quite interesting. Yes, we've had some excellent speakers. Thursday nights are totally different, because that's when we play games. That's especially fun for the children. The children love Fridays, too, because that's talent show night. Everyone gets in on that. Staff, guests, everyone. It looks like you have a lot of fun at Golden Lake Resort. We do. And we end every week with big fun, with a dance on Saturday night. Now I understand a little more why Golden Lake is such a popular place for family vacations. With such a variety of activities... There's something for every member of the family there. There is, and I hope your listeners will consider spending their next vacation with us. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part three. Part three. You will hear a student union officer explaining about the union's functions and services to a group of new university students. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Hello, everyone. Now, here you all are, new university students. And the first question you probably have is, what is a student union? Another question is, do I have to join? Well, regarding this second question, let me say that membership used to be compulsory in the past, but that did cause some controversy, particularly from students who wanted to remain free and unaffiliated, and this university responded. So, joining up is no longer compulsory. It's totally up to you, although I'll admit there is a fairly strong obligation to join since all students benefit from the large variety of services that we offer. We do understand, however, that many might be unwilling to join because of a supposed political slant to the union. Traditionally, student unions have been seen as being dominated by the left and I suppose that's still true to a large extent. Here, however, at this university, our union discourages such one-sided viewpoints and students across the whole political spectrum are welcome. Thus, if you feel that you are a conservative type, in other words, leaning to the right, you are particularly urged to join to provide a more balanced representation. Now, let me move back to the first question. What are we? We are a formal organisation, but totally independent of the educational body. We make our own rules, rent our own premises, and organise ourselves as we wish. 
and our mission is basically to help you. For example, do you remember how you all arrived in late February to have an orientation week? That gave you an invaluable induction into life here, right? Well, the student union organized all the festivities at the end of that. The barbecues, partying and drinking, and even the musical entertainment as well. We'll do that again on occasions, and as always, those events take place on the football ground. Now, do you have any questions before I move on? Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Now, let me tell you more about the Student Union and its basic functions. In general, there are three, social, organisational and representational. Let's look at the first one. Basically, the Union provides many social outlets for you to relax and have a better life at university. If you go to our union office, you'll find a list of the many clubs and societies we have, where you can make many friends with people who share a common interest. So, after class, sit with them in the cafeteria and discuss whatever takes your fancy. We also maintain sporting facilities and even our own gym, allowing you to relieve some of that pressure and worry after a particularly hard session in the classroom. And we have some small shops and other places where you can buy clothes and sporting gear, in other words, some retail outlets. And if you flash your student union card, you'll get up to 20% discount at the bookshop. But unfortunately, there are no discounts at the union cafeteria. Sorry, no cheap cappuccinos. Finally, there's a student union newspaper and you're welcome to contribute or put in advertisements if you're buying and selling goods or textbooks. You can also place notices of a more personal nature on the notice board of the union office itself. All right, let's move on to our more serious functions, which are helping you get through life here, as well as representing you in times of trouble. Regarding the second issue, if you have a problem or a grievance, or if you feel under pressure or depressed for reasons both inside and outside the university, for example, perhaps a dispute with your landlord or the people in your local gym, then come to us. We have a range of counsellors and helpers, and even some lawyers, who you can meet in the conference room. So, just sip a cup of tea or coffee with them and tell them your troubles, and they'll be all ears. Basically, there's every reason to join the student union, since whatever you need, whether it be social or representational, we will help you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You will hear a lecture giving advice on how to present a seminar paper. First read questions 31 to 40. Complete the notes of the outline. Write no more than three words in each answer.
In this talk, I am going to give some advice on how to present a seminar paper. At one time, most university teaching took the form of giving formal lectures. Nowadays, many university teachers try to involve their students more actively in the learning process. One of the ways in which this is done is by conducting seminars. In a seminar, what usually happens is this. One student is chosen to give his ideas on a certain topic. These ideas are then discussed by the other students, the participants in the seminar. What I'd like to discuss with you today is the techniques of presenting a paper at a seminar. As you know, there are two main stages involved in this. One is the preparation stage, which involves researching and writing up a topic. The other stage is the presentation stage, when you actually present the paper to your audience. It is this second stage that I am now concerned with. Let us therefore imagine that you have been asked to lead off a seminar discussion and that you have done all the necessary preparation. In other words, you have done the research and you have written it up. How are you going to present it? There are two ways in which this can be done. The first method is to circulate copies of the paper in advance to all the participants. This gives them time to read it before the seminar, so that they can come already prepared with their own ideas about what you have written. The second method is where there is no time for previous circulation, or there is some other reason why the paper cannot be circulated. In that case, of course, the paper will have to be read aloud to the group, who will probably make their own notes on it while they are listening. In this talk, I am going to concentrate on the first method, where the paper is circulated in advance, as this is a most efficient way of conducting a seminar. But most of what I am going to say also applies to the second method, and indeed may be useful to remember any time you have to speak in public. You will probably be expected to introduce your paper even if it has been circulated beforehand. There are two good reasons for this. One is that the participants may have read the paper but forgotten some of the main points. The second reason is that some of the participants may not in fact have had time to read your paper, although they may have glanced through it quickly. They will therefore not be in a position to comment on it unless they get some idea of what it is all about. When you are introducing your paper, what you must not do is simply read the whole paper aloud. This is because, firstly, if the paper is a fairly long one, there may not be enough time for discussion. From your point of view, the discussion is the most important thing. It is very helpful for you if other people criticise your work. In that way, you can improve it. Secondly, a lot of information can be understood when one is reading. It is not so easy to pick up detailed information when one is listening. In other words, there may be a lack of comprehension or understanding. Thirdly, it can be very boring listening to something being read aloud. Anyway, some of your audience may have read your paper carefully and will not thank you for having to go through all of it again. Therefore, what you must do is follow the following nine points. 1. Decide on a time limit for your talk. Tell the audience what it is. Stick to your time limit. This is very important. 2. Write out your spoken presentation in the way that you intend to say it. This means that you must do some of the work of writing the paper again, in a sense. You may think that this is a waste of time, but it isn't. If a speaker tries to make a summary of his paper while he is standing in front of his audience, the results are usually disastrous. 3. Concentrate only on the main points. Ignore details. Hammer home the essence of your argument. If necessary, find ways of making your basic points so that your audience will be clear about what they are. 4. Try to make your spoken presentation lively and interesting. This doesn't necessarily mean telling jokes and anecdotes. But if you can, think of interesting or amusing examples to illustrate your argument. Use them. 5. If you are not used to speaking in public, write out everything you have to say, including example etc. 
Rehearse what you are going to say until you are word perfect. 6. When you know exactly what you are going to say, reduce it to outline notes. Rehearse your talk again, this time from the outline notes. Make sure you can find your way easily from the outline notes to the full notes, in case you forget something. 7. At the seminar, speak from the outline notes, but bring both sets of notes and your original paper to the meeting. Knowing that you have a full set of notes available will be good for your self-confidence. 8. Look at your audience while you are speaking. The technique to use is this. First, read the appropriate parts of your notes silently. If you are using outline notes, this won't take long. Then, look up at your audience and say what you have to say. Never speak while you are still reading. While you are looking at your audience, try to judge what they are thinking. Are they following you? You will never make contact with your audience if your eyes are fixed on the paper in front of you. 9. Make a strong ending. One good way of doing this is to repeat your main points briefly and invite questions or comments. Perhaps I can sum up by saying this. Remember that listening is very different from reading. Something that is going to be listened to has therefore got to be prepared in a different way from something that is intended to be read. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.